Hello, everybody. It's good to see you all here. God be with you uh, in your worship tonight. May, uh, may your, your presence here be a blessing to you as, as I am confident God has something good in store for you from his word or some encouragement, some direction for your life. Um, there's always the message of forgiveness that comes with receiving the Lord's Supper. So... Whatever, whatever brought you here or whatever you may be expecting, I just pray God's blessings on that. And how great to see a children's choir tonight. Um, we're so glad to, to, have, uh, to have that resuming and, and uh, it's, it's great kids that you're here. Oh, and Mr. Wook decided to come back. <laughs> you survived your cross country drive, huh? I did. Very good, I'm glad to see that. All right, um, so if you are a member of St. John's, don't forget to take one of the white attendance cards and let us know that you were here tonight. And uh, if we have some visitors, no doubt uh, with our school kids, school kids here, we have some guests uh, among us. You'll notice somewhere near you on the back of the pew, there's a blue card that looks like this, says guests on the top. We'd really love to know that, that you have joined us tonight. So if you'd fill uh, one of those out, and uh, as you, as you leave, uh, leave church tonight, you'll see there's uh, some offering plates on the table back there, and you can leave your card um, in, the, in the offering plate. And of course, uh, members of St. John do remember to worship and honor God with your offering this evening. If you, if you have not uh, mailed it or done it online or some other way, uh, which are all great, by the way, um, but there's a, the offering plate is for you to use as well. And um, a welcome to our online uh, worshipers this evening. I often forget that you're out there and to say something to you, but uh, we are so pleased that, uh, that, that you're uh, able to join us uh, via your computer or your phone or, or uh, wherever, it, wherever you may be accessing that. Something I want to say about that, though, you know, we're really happy that we can offer that, but what I've been noticing this last week or two, hearing, a, hearing a reports on TV about some of the basketball games and baseball uh, tournaments and what have you, sold out, okay? 
I had lunch at a restaurant today. There was a waiting line at two in the afternoon. Um, the malls and, and shops are busy again. What am I saying? It's time to come back to church in person. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, we want to give you communion. And we want your kids to be attending Sunday school. So, uh, um, you know, there, have been, there has not been one report of anyone catching anything that I've heard from coming to church. So we're still being careful, you know. Um, for, for the time being, we're still asking people to mask and spread themselves out, but really, it's safe. And uh, we want you to be back in community. We want you to see friends or make new friends. And so please uh, really think about this. As, as much as we're delighted, aren't we, Kurt, um, to be able to offer, um, offer this service, especially to some of our shut-ins, our people who live at a distance, uh, if you live near Elgin, please come back. Um, okay, a couple other things to mention. Um, I just mentioned the word Sunday school in connection with uh, wanting you know, to have kids coming back. Uh, but remember that we are now offering Sunday school again this year. So it's at, um, where's that note from Dick? It is at 9.15. It is in the gym basement. So I'm assuming you know where that is or how to find it, or you can ask somebody uh, when you show up if you don't know where it is. Where's Sunday school in the gym basement and somebody will show you. Um, I want to especially say this to families whose kids are not in our St. John's school. You know, this is really where, the, where kids learn uh, to, to know, be familiar with the Bible, to understand you know, what is called salvation history. How did God work over a course of thousands of years uh, to bring Jesus to you today? So parents, um, get your kids in Sunday school. Sunday mornings, 9.15. Um, I've also been asked to let you know, and the best thing I can say about this is there's a handout in the, out in the narthex. And did I see ushers passing out these little flyers? about the school auction. OK. Um, so like last year, it's going to be online rather than in person. They're especially looking for people who have something that they can donate for this, You know, some good product or service that, that uh, would appeal to people. So anyway, read the brochure. I don't want to um, burden you with stuff you can do for yourself. Um, but just draw your attention to it. OK. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other thing. Um, you all know how we do our prayers here. Usually an elder does the, the, um, the, the main theme of the prayer, and then I alert you it's time to say, hear our prayer by saying, Lord, in your mercy. Well, we, um, we get a template for our prayers off of Synod's website. Saves us a little time so I don't have to write all the prayers out. Well, there was something wrong with Synod's website today, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I couldn't get to that. And I didn't have time to write them all um, from scratch, and so I'm going to do the prayers tonight without the elder, because I wasn't about to say to the elder, here's the list, you do the prayers. Um, so, uh, so the elder will not come out after the sermon, as he usually does, and it's not very important. But I know some of you, if you didn't see it happening, you'd be distracted from the actual prayers by wondering, where's the elder? So, um, so don't wonder. I'm going to be doing him, and that's the reason why, all right? So you all have your order of service. Uh, let's take that and uh, begin our worship uh, with actually with the opening hymn.
Gracious God, you send your blessing now each morning all our days. For your mercy never ending, for your love we offer praise. For we praise that we your people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. be with you. Let us pray. O God, your divine wisdom sets in order all things in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all things hurtful and give us those things that are beneficial for us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading is from Ecclesiastes, the fifth chapter. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil, that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, 
let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter the rest, as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his, as he has said, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. God and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in his, this passage he said, they shall not re enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints, of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, young people. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. 
And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I'm just curious, um, how many people here have an offshore account in the Cayman Islands? What? You mean I'm the only one? Okay, I don't have one either. And if anyone here did have an account like that, of course, they wouldn't raise their hand because, well, then it wouldn't be a secret account anymore. Do you even know anyone who does? If we knew someone like that, and I don't think I do as far as I know, on the one hand, we might admire their financial savvy for making that decision, or, or maybe we would envy their wealth. Presumably, everyone who has offshore accounts has very large amounts of money in them. Or on the other hand, knowing someone had offshore accounts, we might be a little bit judgmental toward them because, well, after all, even though I presume having offshore accounts is perfectly legal, Many people, I think, consider them unethical because they're clearly a tax dodge. Don't know if you caught the news that's been coming out in the last uh, two weeks or so, but there has been a huge expose, uh, which have come to be known for some reason as the Pandora Papers. Somehow, some journalists apparently hacked into the, these offshore banking systems. And, you know, in, in a lot of places around the world, places like countries like Switzerland, Panama, the United Arab Emirates, South Dakota, yeah, South Dakota. And then they leaked, made public, 11.9 million documents revealing these offshore accounts of more than 130 billionaires, 35 current or former world leaders, plus a whole bunch of celebrities, CEOs, and more people that we've never heard of. And all these people together their combined little nest eggs total possibly as much as $32 trillion. And of course, to make it really news, because I mean, who really cares very much about offshore banking and what have you, they have also dug out some kind of juicy details. That's what gets into the news, right? For example, the wife of a, of a former British prime minister uh, bought a piece of property in London for six and a half million pounds, but she did it through a shell company in the British Virgin Islands and thereby saved herself a 312,000 pound tax bill. And how about Russian President Vladimir Putin, who bought a condo in Monte Carlo for his alleged mistress shortly after she gave birth to a baby girl that people assume to be his. Why would people do this? Not why would they expose it. Why would people go through all that to put their money in, uh, in accounts like that. Why, for example, would the emir of Qatar, whose net worth, according to Wikipedia, is seven billion pounds, and I don't know what seven billion pounds is in dollars, but I'm sure it's a lot. Why would he need a tax shelter? Doesn't he have enough money that he could pay his taxes, and still have a few billion left over? Just how many billions of dollars or of pounds does it take to live comfortably in Qatar? King Solomon, the author of our Old Testament lesson 
in this service shares an insight on that, I think. He wrote, you heard this a few minutes ago, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. I kind of like the way I read it in a different translation that said, he who loves money never has enough. Nor he who loves wealth with his income. John D. Rockefeller, the founder of the Standard Oil Company and during his lifetime, the richest man in America, was once asked, how much money is enough? To which he famously replied, just a little bit more. The book of Ecclesiastes, uh, from which we read that reading at this service, is basically Solomon's musings on the meaning of life. As he's writing this, he's an old man. Well, he's about 60, but in that, in that time period, 60 was pretty old. And he's been king for 40 years. He's very rich. He's famously wise. Never mind that he had hundreds of wives and concubines and that he allowed them to lead him astray spiritually. In the book of Ecclesiastes, he basically looks back on his life and the things that he tried to do or achieve or acquire in order to find happiness, purpose, meaning in life. And he thinks about all the people that he's met and known, the, the rich and powerful, the rulers of other kingdoms, as, as well as the servants and the working people in his palace and in Jerusalem. And he contemplates what it's all about. What is life for? Where does happiness come from? I'm going to assume that many of you have read the book of Ecclesiastes at some time in your life, or, but maybe there are some who haven't. And honestly, I'll tell you the book of Ecclesiastes, most of it, it's kind of depressing because he, he goes through the list of all the things that people try to do and to have in order to have significant lives. And he decides that basically almost none of them work. Money? Nope. Power? Nope. Knowledge and wisdom? Nope. Women? Uh-uh. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Vanity seems to be his favorite word in the book of Ecclesiastes, meaning trivial, worthless. His conclusion, though, on a more positive note, you heard it said a few minutes ago, Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life which God has given him. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. In other words, get a job, work hard, have a good supper, and sleep well kind of a simple formula, isn't it? And, and, and maybe one so basic, so overly simple that we listen to it and we say, nah, that can't be the answer to life. That can't be what it's all about. And yet after years and years of studying his own life and the human condition and observing other people, that's Solomon's basic outcome. Get a job, work hard, have a good supper, and sleep well. You know, it's easier to cast a critical eye on the Emir of Qatar or on Vladimir Putin or on any of the other hundreds of people outed in the Pandora Papers for their inordinate love of money. But that fixation is not only a problem for the uber-rich. 
everyday people like you and me with a middle class paycheck or a social security income can fall into that trap, that sin, just as easily to tell you the truth. What, not you? Well, maybe. But I want you to be honest with yourself. How much do you love money? The way to know whether you love money too much is to see in your own life just how easy it is for you to let go of it. And by the way, I don't mean at the mall. You know, some people have very little money because they have so much stuff. Loving stuff is basically the same as loving money, although probably not as smart. So be honest with yourself. Where are you on that issue, on that question? Are you content with what you have now? That's a big enough issue for a lot of people, but let me add a second addendum onto that. Could you be just as content as you are now if God suddenly took away your income or your investments? Could you do without that ski trip or that cruise to put the cost of that to some human need? Would it be fine with you to drive an older car or to downsize your house in order to be able to have more to share with others? See, it's easy for us to forget what true riches really are. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And believe me, he did not mean by that a 7,000 square foot house with six bedrooms and five and a half baths. St. Paul wrote, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. And he didn't mean by that a million dollar IRA to retire on. You know, I hope that your real wealth in life is what God has done for you. That he created you in his own image, thereby making you a special and important person. That he adopted you back into his family at your baptism that he has walked alongside with you every day of your life. And above all, he gave his one and only son to be your savior and forgive your sins and promise you eternal life. Everything else, family and friends, money and property, daily bread, work and leisure, a beautiful world to enjoy, those are all wonderful too, but those are just a bonus. And whether you have little or much of those things, you have enough. One last thing. Solomon does not say in these passages that we just read that money or wealth is bad, only that loving it will not satisfy you. Near the end of our reading, he says... Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. Well, you know what? God has indeed been very generous to us. We are abundantly blessed, and I'm not just talking about the spiritual things that we talk about in church. In church. We are abundantly blessed materially, every one of us. This is a gift from God, and, and we may enjoy it. 
but always while we do so, remembering where it came from and also that it is a trust from God to be used wisely and carefully and compassionately. Remember, you are rich in many ways. Give thanks to God for his divine mercy and fatherly generosity. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have been so very kind to us. You have poured abundance into our lives. We have not merely what we need, but far more than we need. We have much more than mere daily bread. We have a great deal more than that, that you have given us. Gracious Father, prevent us from ever thinking that, that we never have enough or that we would be happier if only we had this thing or that thing or more of something else. Teach us to be grateful constantly for all your blessings, but above all, for the blessing of your Son through whom we have hope, peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, just as you provide for us individually, we pray that you would provide for all the needs of St. John's congregation and, and for your church everywhere. We pray that you would, that you would uh, provide the, the resources, the blessings, and everything that is needed for St. John's to carry on its ministries and and its uh, gospel outreach and all of the things that we do to glorify you and, and to serve our neighbors. We especially ask that you would move quickly to provide a pastor to lead St. John's into the future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you uh, designed the wonderful relationship between husband and wife and between parent and child and, uh, and all the blessings of community and fellowship and, and relationships. We thank you especially for the blessings of family, which are your creation and your design. We thank you along with those who celebrate uh, special times in their lives and in their families, especially uh, for, uh, the, for Patrick Heffron and Rachel Baum, Baumgarten, who were married um, this weekend, and with Bob and Donna Huffstutler and Dave and Diane Stroyek as they celebrate wedding anniversaries. We pray, Lord, that you would be central in all of, their, in all of these homes and bring great joy and satisfaction as they see your blessings and learn to trust wholeheartedly in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We rise and continue with the order of service on page 6. Thank you. 
Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.